How you doing, Alan? I've talked a little bit about this story before. We're going to look at it in greater detail, and I'm going to show you guys some slides and some, you know, some stuff that I ran into on that thing. That really, it was a sobering situation. But I, this vehicle, uh, let me start out by saying, you know, the name of this is a, uh, I call it boggy territory, because you can get in a boggy territory. I got a boggy territory. Moody is in a boggy territory with his uh, old hard transmission. He's having to do any. It's just tough. Okay, so. We got vehicles nowadays with a lot of aging stuff, and uh, I guess if you, you pull that screen down there, you're going to take it and close it up. But um, what we got, old vehicles with electronics that drive their stuff on them. And I was working in, in uh, we got the Jeep Renault franchise back in the 1980s when I was working at the dealership. And so some of the cars that had been in there for service came up where we were. And now there was a 1981 model Renault 18i. Now this car, you got to remember, this car in those days, 81 model sounds old now, but that was in about 1987. So this car wasn't was six years old. So how, what year model would a six-year-old car be right now? 2007, something like that. I mean, that don't sound all that old. Well, they bring us Renault 18i in there, and you know, to me. You know, I, I was thinking, just as I looked at the car, it really hadn't been maintained all that well. And it wouldn't start. It was dead in the water. Now, I had this funky little GM-style ignition module, similar to that one right there, mounted on a little plate out there that was being triggered by something. And, and I found out that module wasn't any good. And I had got put that module on, I got sparked, but we still had no fuel injection. And so I got to sniffing around in there, and I found out that the engine controller was under the seat. And water had got in there. Somebody left the window down. I don't know what happened. And it was swimming in water for a while. And you could take the engine controller and smell of it and it was like Aunt B's pickles off of Mayberry or, you know, stump. So I go into the parts room and I say, I need to see about getting an engine controller for a 1981 model Renault 18i, you know, this model here. And they said, uh, that'll be uh, $1,800. Or something like that. I say that. May not have been that high, but it was between a thousand and eighteen hundred. You know, it may have been eleven hundred. One way or another, uh, whenever I said, "This is this guy's not going to fix this car." I mean, this car is not worth that. You know, so we went and called the guy. Said it needs an engine controller, and it's going to be this much money. It's a big, huge amount of cash. And he says, "Go ahead and do it." Yeah. Well, I says, "Oh my goodness, what happens if you've made that price and you put it on there? That's still." there's something else wrong. You know what I mean? That caused it to die. So I put it on there and it fired up and he drove away and he was happy to pay the bill. Okay, so here we go. If you, It's really spooky, you know. Uh, these uh, 80s and 90s Eagle Summits, Talons, and Plymouth Lasers have Mitsubishi made stuff on them. They were loaded with so many expensive fuel control system parts. This is, and when these cars were brand new, when these cars were brand new, now think about what I'm about to tell you here. If you bought every part of the fuel injection system for one of those cars, the cost of those parts would be worth would be more than the car cost new. You could buy a whole car cheaper than you could buy all the fuel injection parts that were on the engine. Mass airflow, injectors, all the sensors, and all that, and an engine controller, if you bought that. So you gotta be really careful when you make an estimate on one like that, particularly. So what happens uh, if you put twelve, fifteen hundred dollars in a car, in a vehicle, that somebody said go ahead and fix it, and then when you get through, they ain't got the money, and you can't take the parts back. And I've seen that happen. I saw it happen at dealership. This guy wanted. They said you need twelve hundred dollars worth of motors right, working under your old ratty old Ford truck that was so rusted out that when you mash the clutch, the dashboard would move. He said go ahead and do it, and they fixed it, and then he just didn't pay it. So when they went to auction it off. He was going to be in the crowd and buy it for $100. See what I'm saying? That was his plan. Well, the general manager knew that was going to happen, and so he sent somebody in there and said, make sure you keep bumping that bid up until he pays that old bill. And so we wound up owning that truck, and we used it to haul scrap iron on and all that kind of stuff because that guy didn't. He told us to fix it, and he didn't have the money to fix it. You'll be careful about that. All right. Right after computers first started to appear on vehicles, the parts supplier gave me an opportunity to go to a computer command control class in Houston at General Motors Training Center in 1981. 
And the question of my classmates, I had 12 guys in that class with me. They were asking Ellen Smith, she was an instructor. I said, what's going to happen when one of these cars gets 100,000 miles? Computer, computers were brand new on cars then, you see. What's going to happen when one of these cars get 100,000 miles on it? It won't be a disaster trying to keep all that computer stuff straightened out. She said, well, a properly maintained computer-assisted engine is going to run as well at 100,000 as it did when it was new. And she cited examples of, you know, ones she knew about. Uh, but she said, well, it started if the computer craps out. Well, those days they had a feedback carburetor, so she unplugged the computer and fired it up. Got me. All right. So uh, the in the here and now, though, we know that today's fuel economy and emission standards would be virtually impossible to meet without sophisticated electronics. We've got to have electronics controlling our fuel and our ignition. Well, remember what I told you about gasoline direct injection? What's the difference between gasoline direct injection and regular fuel injection? You remember, anybody remember? What makes gasoline direct injection better in, the, in regard to, you know, the operation of the engine, the emissions, and all that? Yeah. It does, but what's the difference in the way they operate? You do not have control on the fuel injection engines we've got right now. The plain old fuel, well, I mean, gasoline direct injection has been out for years. I mean, there's a lot of vehicles out there with it. So don't be spooked if you open the hood and you find it's got that under uh, it's not all that complicated, but I will tell you that the the thing that's different about gasoline direct injection, where does the fuel where's the fuel injected on one that we have uh, a regular fuel injected engine right behind the intake valve, right? It sprays right behind the intake valve right before the intake valve opens, doesn't it? So this thing is able to time the fuel injection using the cam position sensor, and it knows exactly when to light off that fuel injector pulse so that it'll go in there. Now this is important. And I'm going to tell you, gasoline direct injection can time when the fuel goes in. It can time how it's injected. It can spray it in there as a homogenous charge, or it can have a stratified charge, or instead of going boom, it goes pop, 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 you know, this kind of thing. It makes it a lot more. So you're going to find these pretty good size, like a, something the size of a trailblazer out there. It's got like a 1.6 liter engine in it. It's got as much power as they used to have when they were running a 4.2. You got me? I mean, it's pretty cool. Now, there are other problems that GDI engines have that regular fuel injected engines don't have, like a bunch of crud piling up on the valves is going to be cleaned off and all that kind of stuff. But as far as, you know, economy and emissions and power on a smaller engine and all this, it's, it's a cool thing. They do. Okay, let me keep moving. Um, the, there was a, I, wrote, I wrote about a, that uh, Lexus SC300 uh, that was blowing gasoline steam out of the tailpipe because of a computer problem. Nobody wanted to tackle, and we managed to fix it with a remanufactured powertrain control module. Uh, well, that same old tired Lexus uh, came in a, a few months later needing that power steering hose. It cost $450, and we had to do something about that. Well, there's thousands of uh, uh, cars out there running around that are old that have this electronic stuff on them. And you got to be able to understand how that stuff works. That's part of the reason you're in school. Okay. Where should the line be drawn, though? How much money should a willing customer be able to spend on a car that's drifted past the point of obsolescence? So we got hooked by a talon. That's my next little tagline, hooked by a talon. Okay, here's our talon right here. Let's see if we can. There's our talon. See our talon up there? That's the talon I'm talking about right there. Okay, and it's a little purple talon sitting out there. Uh, pretty cool. It's dead as a doornail. Nobody had touched it. Came riding in on the hook. She said, nobody's touched it. I'm just bringing it to y'all before I take it anywhere else. Okay. I, was, I told her it got to sit a while longer before we could have a look at it. And she didn't seem to be in a lot of hurry. Uh, and it was one of those peculiar transitory Mitsubishi onboard diagnostic compliant units that needs a special adapter cable to talk to the enhanced room in a PCM. And it's got a Y cable. Your scan tool hooks up to the Mitsubishi port and the OBD2 port. It was a screwball, like the silver one that died on go the other day, right? Okay, our scan tool got that Y cable for that. We were able to hook it up, you know, we had the Genesis in we were using. Mounted about, uh, you know, the, the other cable, the two connectors are really close to one another, and our Eagle Talons and uh, Mitsubishi, you know, Eclipse were built about the same way. Uh, the Talon wouldn't talk, though. Well, okay, let me ask you this, guys. What are you going to do when you plug your scan tool in and it won't talk? Check the fuse to the cigarette Well, no, the, the scan tool boots up. Oh, it boots, up. boots up, but it says I can't talk. PCM. You know, like, what, what do you mean PCM? What are you, what are you talking about? Take a gander. You gonna throw the PCM at it or what? No. Oh, take a gander at the PCM. Okay, how do you do that? 
What are you going to do? What's the first thing you're going to check? I'm just, I'm just asking you. All the they got one on the, under the hood? We're talking cheap and easy, Joe, huh? We want to do cheap and easy first, okay? Yeah. There's a diagnostic thing on the, under the hood. Is, is that what it has on not that one. Okay. No, I mean, well, some of the Japanese cars have got that. But no, what I'm going to do is I'm going to find out any electronic component that doesn't work. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to find out if it's got power and ground to that box. I'm going to find the box, and I'm going to find out which pins it is. Or if I've got a relay or a fuse that I see feeding that in my schematic, first place we're going to go, we're going to go to the relay. We're going to go to the fuse. Go to the fuse. The fuse that feeds all your, you know, if you've got one that's going to feed the part of the thing, the relay that fire, wakes up all the electronics and gets it ready, it's going to wake up the stuff on the engine. Like on these Chrysler vehicles, you've got an automatic shutdown relay that powers up the fuel injectors, powers up the alternator fuel, powers up the ignition coil, and that particular relay has got a fuse feeding it. And you know, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the fuel injector, and that's an easy way to do it, uh, depending on how it's wired. Like on a Ford, the fuel injectors and the engine controller and all of the solenoids that are operated by the computer are fed by the red wire that comes from the power relay. That's typically what goes on there, right? Now, and even the fuel pump relay coil. Everything is controlled by the engine controller is fed by that, except, except the ignition coil on a Ford is fed directly from the ignition switch. So it's not something that you can check and tell. Okay, so I'm going to go to the injectors to begin with. I'm going to turn on the key, or I'm going to just to spin it, and I'm going to go to the injector with my little test light, and I'm going to go in there, you got a test in there that you can dig out of your box for this thing we're doing here now. I'm going to go in there and I'm going to see if I've got power to those injectors. I also want to know if I got, you know, if the air, out of air control valve on those forges, you got two wires going to it when I'm red, coming from the power relay. I'm going to check out one. Is it powered up? Then I'm going to find out where my grounds are. You know, and you, if you'll locate your grounds, locate your powers, you're going to check and make sure that you got good, strong grounds and power. And I'm talking about with a low impedance test light checking those grounds and those powers. Because if they ain't enough power going, if they're not enough current available there, you may light a high impedance test light, like one of the little LED test lights. You may think there's something there and there's not. So you need to definitively know is there enough of anything there that you put work. So uh, what happens if you find power and ground at your engine controller and you know and it knows that you turned on the key and all that? What are you gonna do next? You're gonna check the fuel system. Well, I want to know Electrical, you know, the next thing I'm going to go to, because this is a dead in the water no start, right? Mm -hmm. Now, you can check your, you know, you can check your spark. Let's say we ain't got spark. Right. We already done that. You're going to check your fuel injector or your fuel pressure. See if you got fuel pressure. You know, well, we ain't got fuel pressure either. You know, we're not firing. We're not clicking injectors. We ain't sparking. We ain't got no fuel pressure. And what are we going to do now? I mean, you got to have a, you got to have an attack plan, guys. You know what I mean? Just like that. Well, if, I, if I don't have fuel pressure, I, I guess I need to check the line between my fuel... No, 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 no. you got to back up. The engine controller has got power and ground, but it's not doing anything. That's the point. It ain't firing injectors. It ain't firing coils. It ain't turning on no fuel pump. So the next thing I'm going to do, what do we have coming out of there going to our sensors? On this particular one, we've got two reference voltage feeds. We've got a 5-volt reference voltage feed going to the throttle position sensor, your 3-wire sensors, and then to your 2-wire sensors, you got one that's got a, like 4.6. So when you unplug them, it goes to 4.6. When you plug them in, it goes down to the whatever the reading is. You know, all right, so we've got that. But on these Mitsubishis and on the Chryslers, you have a 9-volt feed that's going out to your Hall effect switches, which your Hall effect switch would be like your cam position sensor, your crank position sensor, there's nine volts going down there on this particular vintage of Chrysler. Okay, so we had no reference voltage. Okay, so we, we check it with our meter. Now you can't check reference voltage with a test light, so don't go there. Your test light's what you're gonna check and see if your power your computer's power and grounded. This is important because one day you're gonna be standing there with a the hood open and somebody that hired you is going to expect you to be able to do this without supervision. You got me? To begin with, remember, scan tool wouldn't talk. Everybody wants to depend heavily on that scan tool, but if a scan tool don't talk, you may as well put it back in your toolbox because it ain't worth a flip. You got me? Now, if the scan tool won't talk but the engine runs, now you got a network problem probably. But the point, point is, you got a scan tool that won't talk. you got power and ground to the engine controller. The engine controller does not put out any reference voltage 
to any sensor, whether it be a Hall effect or in this particular one, you got a nine volt reference signal going to your Hall effect sensors on an orange wire, and you got your five volt wire going to your other sensors, and all that's dark. So now what are we gonna do? It's a no crank. It's a no start. No 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 no. You gotta listen to it. No, well, let's think about what I'm saying now. Controller's powered up. It's responsible for producing this reference voltage, but it ain't producing any. Well, now we've got two possibilities. I can check the reference wire to see if it's bad. I see if it's shorted. It's shorted yeah. Bingo. We're going to unplug the engine controller, and we're going to see if we can detect a short to ground on those wires. Right? Well, in this particular case, you know, there's nothing coming out of this darn thing. It's got power and ground, all that sort of stuff. So let's just get another engine controller, and we could get one for two hundred dollars, you know, from the dealer. wasn't that bad? But it so tur it turned out that engine controller from that was for that one was a Chrysler type engine controller, sixty pin connector and all that. So we put it on there. The students got it and put it on. The car was sitting right back down there. And the students got to put it on. They fired the car up with a new engine controller on it. They got reference voltage and everything. Hey, this is wonderful, you know. Hey, we figured it out. We're good. We pull it back up there. We park it right outside the door here, and it's sitting there idling. It runs about 20 minutes, and it burns up that engine controller. Okay. Lovely. Oh, this is just wonderful. Now what are you going to do? You found the problem. What in the sound hill caused it? This is not fun. I mean, because you're saying, goodness gracious, we spent $200 of their money. Think about how much if that, if that engine controller, controller costs $2,000. And on some of them it does. And then you're like, well, that's the end of work on that? No, it's something between there and the engine controller. But they're not going to pay you for that $2,000 engine controller. Who's going to buy that? That'll come out of the shop. Yeah, when the car's fixed, they'll pay for it. Yeah. So there's the new engine controller was able to accept whatever voltage was coming through there, I guess. But there's something. Something destroyed it. Destroyed it. And you got to figure out why. Now, here's your engine controller right here. Yeah. Now, this one here. You know, the one farther from the battery is not a PCM because it doesn't control the transaxle. It's only an EC, a engine control module. The other one's the transmission controller. See the one over there? I'm going to turn this camera around so yeah, we can see the screen. Both of mine look like that. Yeah. Like, like in my Eclipse. Yeah. That's what mine looks like. Yeah. There you go. All right. So that's what you got there. We got an engine controller. Hey there. Hey. All right. So we've got that one. Uh -huh. Put closer to the battery. The one closest to the battery, though, this one right here is the engine controller. That's the transmission controller. Okay. Right here. On this particular one right here. And uh, we've actually had to replace this. Now, let me ask you this. One time we had a, a vehicle that a guy had that uh, we put a <coughs> transmission in and it wouldn't shift right. No, I remember what it was. It was like a different one. Uh, there was a Chrysler vehicle that wouldn't shift right after you drove it a little while, but if you switched it off and restarted it, it would start shifting around again. Now we got to use transmission controller for that one and put it on there, and it was that was all it needed. Um, so this is actually looking. There's the battery. We're kind of taking. It, we're looking down. We're standing in front of the car, and we're looking down at it. Cause there's the shock tower. You see that? Yeah. Why is there a wire running in? Uh, that's something somebody hooked up for a radio or something. I don't, I don't yeah, know that's probably. Yeah, yeah. that's some of the some of that kind of work that Joe does. But okay, now then, we got this uh, particular thing here. Uh, <laughs> okay. So the next thing we did was we got the dynamic data collector. The dynamic data collector is outdated, but it's powerful, and it can talk to that thing, but it has to have a computer with an ISA port to work. I paid $9,000 for that box. It came from Snap-on. Snap-on bought Sun. Sun designed it originally, and I think Sun bought it from another outfit, another company built it. And it connects between the engine controller and the wire harness. And you tell the, well, first you've got to tell the program, the software, what kind of car you're working on. Then it tells you which adapter you need. The adapters cost from $500 to $1,000. This particular one, you can rent the adapter from Snap-on for $50 a day. So I rented the adapter. And I got it in here, and I hooked it up, and I took my dynamic, dynamic uh, data connector up there. DDC is what they call it, dynamic data connector. So it goes over. It's VIN specific. They program that software with everything that's supposed to be on every one of those pins as far as volts, ohms, everything. And you can do something on that one that I've never seen any other tool that's called a sweep test. You turn it on. You do what it says. You First you turn it off and it checks ohms on every wire. 
and then you turn it on because it's hooked up to every wire and then it checks volts on every wire and it knows what they're supposed to be and it lights the ones up in red that aren't right. Never seen anybody else do that. The closest thing I've ever seen to that is a service bay diagnostic system for it yet. It was pretty close to that, but this thing right here was phenomenal. But in 1999, they stopped updating it and they just kind of put it in mothballs. And I still got one out here. But the computer that I was using it with has got an ISA port, which is a big, long, ugly port that you got to have, you know, and an old computer. Nobody has them. You got to get an adapter for a computer now for about $150. Anyway, you hook that son of a gun up. You can use it for an oscilloscope and all that. And I'll mention that to you later. Okay, this thing's outdated. So here we are. We're working on this thing. We plug this in. And this is the screen we got. See that? Screenshot of the first bunch of failures and sweep test found after the replacement engine controller failed. A common denominator from voltage reference was a rare commodity when the test was done. See that? There's your voltage reference. Yeah, can't read it off. This is what the minimum and the max is supposed to be. The units are volt and was out of spec. It had nothing. Alright. Now, if y'all remember when we first plugged it in, it cranked it around for 20 minutes and then it died. Nobody had worked on this car before we got to it. Alright, so all right, so here we were, working along here. Now then, I borrowed from my 95, I said Dodge Neon, the Plymouth Neon. I did, this, I did a search of the pins on the Plymouth Neon. And it said, are the pins, and pin for pin on that 95 Plymouth Neon, the engine controller was the same with the exception of one wire going to the transaxle. Everything else was the same. And I said, with that in mind, I'm gonna take a chance. This is my trainer car. I'm going to pull the engine controller off the trainer car, plug it into this one. We ain't going to start it. We're only going to do a sweep test. I had the idea that if the sweep test doesn't take very long, maybe we won't burn mine up. If we burn mine up, I'll just have to buy another one, right? So we plugged it in. Look what we found. See the one that lit up in red? The only one that lit up in red was the throttle position sensor, right? Okay. Minimum is supposed to be 10.55. Maximum is supposed to be 1.28. It had 0 0.05. It was out of spec. I've never seen this in my career before or since, and I'm sure other people may have seen it. That throttle position sensor burned up that engine controller. Now, you can short out a throttle position sensor usually. It won't hurt it. It ain't a big deal. There's no current there. So why did they destroy the engine controller? Heck, I don't know, but I know it did. So I got an $85 throttle position sensor. And we put on that car, and we got another engine controller from the people over there. I mean, they were gracious enough to say, well, we'll defect that one out. Plug that thing in. <clears throat> she drove off on that talon, and it ran like a sewing machine until they ran it low on oil, and the engine started knocking. Mm. You know, I mean, that was a different problem. That was like three years later. Okay, so the long and short of it was, when I disconnected the TPS, I got this. See, this is your minimum and your maximum. Now, do you know how long it would take you to take a breakout box or your voltmeter and measure all that hogwash with a mere one pin at the time and compare it to what it was supposed to be? What pin is this? Where is it going? What's it supposed to be? Let me see what it is. Cool. Write it down. This thing right here is as cool as all get out because you say, sweep test. Back up, close your arms, and you watch it. <laughs> Bing, 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 beep, 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 beep. This was like that. It's like Robocop. Okay, here we got $85 aftermarket throttle position sensor. All right, now this right here, this is something else I'm going to tell you about while I'm here because this was extremely interesting to me. And uh, we got to, we got to, this is going to be over before you know it. Uh, this is what, a, what, this is a normal injector pulse. Have you seen that on one of our scopes? You have, right? What you got here, you're measuring the wire it triggers the injector with. You got 12 volts here. When it pulls at the ground, for this amount of time that injector is open, this is voltage over time, right? For that amount of time the injector is open. When the injector is closed, when it takes away that ground that got the injector open and fuel spread, you get a voltage spike that's about 50 volts. That's what it's supposed to look like. And then it's going to go until the next time. Well, this car, this, this was taken. And this is really weird, and this is one that I don't have the answer for, but I'm going to tell you the story anyway. Pontiac, 85. It was 10 years older than that one, but it's got electronics on it and all this. And the girl says, my cousin put a intake manifold on this thing, 
or intake manifold gasket on it. A lot of them old, you know, engines in that vintage needed intake manifold gasket. Ever since he put the intake manifold gasket on, it's been skipping. Okay, been skipping ever since the intake manifold. Gasket. Found out it was skipping on the cylinder, which is the back one closest to the passenger over there. And so, I'm, what do you do? It's skipping on its cylinder. What you gonna do? I'm gonna, to begin with, I'm gonna listen to the injector. You know, I mean, what, remember what I told you when you're troubleshooting? Start with the easy. <laughs> Don't start with the hard. Don't pull that cylinder head off because it's skipping before you've checked everything out. Come out with mechanic stethoscope. I'm listening to the injectors comparing them. Ever the rest of them have got this crisp little click, 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 click. That one's going clunk, 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 clunk. It sounds different. It's weak. And I said, ha, that's interesting. So I got another injector. That, you know, I bought one. It's like $80. And I put it in there. And because you know, if it's making a different noise than all the other ones, and it's just a sequential system, it fires it in firing order. Each injector's got its own driver. Hooked up, put that new injector in there, and what does the old farmer say whenever you didn't get his truck fixed? Did you take it wood? Did you take it wood? <laughs> didn't change a daggum thing. Click, 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 click. So I check and I say, doggone it, what's going on here? And so I check the resistance of the, um, of the thing, it's like it's pulling 0.85 amps. Okay, I'm checking the resistance, I'm checking the wires going back to the engine controller, which is, you know, but that thing is too doggone old. I called Johnny over there and he goes, I got a whole box of them, I'll sell you one for $20. So I've got a $20 engine controller because there's nothing wrong with the wires, there's nothing wrong with any part of it, the connectors were good. But let me show you what my pattern looked like. Look at that. Now look, I'm going to go back and forth. Normal, abnormal, normal, abnormal. See that skinny little stupid thing? Mm -hmm. So I said, well, it's got to be in the PCM because what else could cause it to have a narrow pulse on that one injector? That injector's got the same amount of resistance as the rest of them. It wasn't drawing too much current or anything. And so I hooked that son of a gun up. Let me make sure that I'm not running out of time over here. Yeah. Okay. I hooked that dog old thing up. And new engine, engine controller is just like it was still. Nothing has changed. Saying, what irritating is all good? And it's still skipping on number three because it's not putting enough gas in there, you see. And why did this happen when he changed the intake? He didn't cause it, as far as I know. Got to say that if, if the engine controller is only this far from the injector, so there's not anything hidden that I'm not seeing because you could actually expose the wire all the way. And so I said, well, let me get another engine controller. So I got another one, put another one. Do you think it would? Do you think it would? So anyway, I said, all right, let me do this. I said, I'm going to take, we got nothing to lose because we've got a bunch of engine controllers here. I'm going to take a Scotch lock. You know that thing you hook two wires together with when you put your boat trailer on your truck and all? You know what I'm talking about? The little blue thing? Yeah. And I'm going to Scotch lock the injector right next to it, the signal to that one. And let the same driver that's driving the injector next to it operate that one. So I did that. It was smooth as stuff. And I said, drive this thing on. She lived in Daleville a long way from here. And if you have any trouble with it, I mean, anything will quit on you, but if it starts skipping again, we'll know something. And so he drove that son of a gun forever, you know. And every time I saw her, man, it's still running great. Driving around with that blue scotch lock on there. Why? I got that sucker fixed, but I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> and I was talking to some people from General Motors at a school that I went to. So I had these General Motors engineers, and I explained that situation to them. And I said, tell me. I said, I got six drivers of that engine controller. One of them sent in a narrow pulse. I put another engine controller, that another engine controller still sent in the same kind of narrow pulse because I measure it every time. Why? You know what they said? I don't know. But you didn't hurt anything. I said, really? They said, yeah. At least one of those drivers is designed to pull four amps. And you're just pulling 1.6. It'll last forever. Ain't a problem. Just leave it alone. <laughs> You know, you want to be able to surgically go in there and say, this is exactly what the problem was. This was why this was doing this, and blah, blah, blah. This lady couldn't care less. There's a ratty old 85 Grand Prix, and she just wanted it to run without skipping. She didn't want to drive down the road, feel like she was firing a machine gun, and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And whenever she drove it, from then on, it ran good. You know, the car was probably worth $150 running. You know what I'm saying? So she spent more on what it was worth. So was it rusted? Huh? Was it really rusted? What? The, the car was just a junk bomb. But anyway, now we're going to do our test real quick and we'll get out of here. Now you're not going to get this kind of stuff anywhere else except for me. All right. Uh, what signal or signals do all electronic fuel injection macroprocessors need in order to operate the fuel injectors? 
crankshaft speed and position, if you don't have a crank signal, you don't have any fuel injection and you don't have any spark. When did we see that recently and troubleshoot a vehicle that had that problem? Remember the Explorer. The Explorer had no crank because the uh, balancer came apart and ate up the crank sensor. Right Now, was the crank sensor the cause? Was the crank sensor the cause? No. no. The balancer was the cause. The crank sensor was the effect. And the extended effect was that when the crank sensor was destroyed, you had no you know, pulse. Okay. Now, what three wires lead from the powertrain control module to the throttle position sensor? Reference voltage, reference ground, and signal. So you got five volts. You got a reference ground. You got signal. The signal's going back. So as you move your throttle or whatever, your signal is going to change. But your reference ground and your and your reference voltage and your reference ground is supposed to remain constant. All right. Let me ask you this briefly. What if I cut the reference ground wire? What am I going to read on that signal wire? You cut the ground. Yeah. If, the, if somebody, let's say the ground gets rubbed in two. What if I what if I had to cut the ground and what if I do some of this stuff for a final? Five volts. You see five volts on that wire? I want to see if I got good reference ground. How do you do that? I'm going to unplug it and check and see if I got a ground there. Now you can use the high impedance test light for that to check that ground without hurting anything. If you happen to short that ground to power though, it's going to destroy it inside the engine controller. You know what I'm saying? So you don't want to go there. All right. Now I did see a car one time that came in, old Lincoln, that had the signal return ground destroyed inside the engine controller for some reason or another. I don't know why. And I just ran a ground to the to the uh, frame <laughs> and pulled a one, you know, ground, and it ran all right. Uh, reference voltage on most electronic fuel injected vehicles is what? Five volts. Five volts is what it is. Now remember, on your Chrysler stuff with the orange wire going to those three wire Hall effect sensors, you're going to have an orange wire with nine volts. And so sometimes on the old stuff, like at four, earlier early model Ford E3 systems, you had a nine volt reference voltage going to the sensors. When all shop manual pinpoint tests have been exhausted and no problems have been isolated with the harnesses, connectors, uh, volt, connected voltages or components, what should be done next? A, push the car outside. Planned obsolescence has prevailed. That's Joe's way, okay? Uh, B, if possible, connect a good powertrain control module. C, transfer the powertrain control module from the problem vehicle to an identical normal vehicle. B, but only if C isn't possible. B, but only if C isn't possible. Yeah, the reason that I'm saying that is, what if you, based on what we just heard about this ego, if you've got a good engine controller, that you've got on your shelf or you've pulled off somebody else or, you know, another car that you've got on your service lot that belongs to the shop or whatever, like I did, you unplug that and you plug it into another car that's got a problem, you're subject to destroy that second engine controller. <laughs> so the smart thing to do, like when I was working on my buddy Alan Waters' 91 Ford pickup and it was cutting up and firing the coil all kind of renegade and clicking a bunch of stuff, and I checked all the grounds and everything, and then I says, well, I think this engine controller is bad, but how do I check? Oh, his daddy's got a truck just like this. Same year model, same everything. Unplug the bad engine controller, take it down there, plug it into his daddy's truck, and his daddy's truck started acting the same way. Now I know i got a bad engine controller. I'm not going to hurt a truck with an engine controller. Got me? Right. But I will hurt an engine controller with a truck. A bad truck will just, can destroy a good engine controller. It can. But a bad engine controller is not going to hurt a good truck. You see, if the good truck is acting the way the other one did, now you've, you're you done with your troubleshooting. But so, is that the problem, though? Oh, yeah. I mean, so it might have been a bad truck. It Could have been. That's a good point. Uh, but the fact is, you've done everything you can at that point. Mm -hmm. In your shop manual, sometimes it'll say substitute no good part because they run out of ideas. You know what I'm saying? But that, the answer to that one is D. Uh, B, but only C, it's impossible. Okay, this particular schematic pinout, such as the one shown here, represents a view of what? We're looking at all of these pins and everything. Is it the component connector, the back side of the pigtail, facing into the harness connector, or none of the above? Component, component connector would mean if you look in, if you hold the engine controller up and you look into it, you know, the, all the pins. Mm -hmm. And you see a schematic like this one right here, and you see what we're looking at on that screen right there. You're looking at facing into the harness connector. Do not get confused by that. And I'll show you what I mean. See this right here? This little thing in a building? All right, watch. You look at this right here. You look at that harness connector right there. And you look at this thing right here. You're going to see that this particular connector here is reversed. If you just look at it right there. 
you're actually looking at a reversed, a mirror image of that. So if you take that harness connector and you look into it, that's what you're seeing here. See that? And so basically when I'm putting this on here, I've got to make sure that I hook these things up right because this is a mirror image of that. It's, you're not looking into the sensor, you're looking into the harness. That's the whole point. All right. Yeah, 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 come on, we won't, be long, we won't be long in here. We're almost done. Ohm's law basically states what? Think about it. One out, one out. No. Okay, one, one volt, volt pushes, pushes one out through one ohm. That's just yeah. real basic. Yeah, I knew it was a volt there. One ohm was pushing yeah. <laughs> I got two six ohm bulbs wired in parallel. How much resistance I got? Two, two six yeah. ohm bulbs are wired in parallel. How much resistance would they have? Twelve. Willie, they're wired. Whoa, you said 18. 18, then. <laughs> six ohm. and six is, six and six is twelve. Two six ohm bulbs wired in parallel. When you see something like that on any test, and you're probably going to, if you go to work in a dealership somewhere, they're going to send you to electrical school, they're probably going to show you something like this. It's always less than the lowest. If they're in parallel, if they're in series, you add them. If it's you actually, if they're both the same and they're wired in parallel, it's going to be half of what each one of them is. Because if you've got two, remember I told you you got water in a bucket, and you drill a like if you drill a little bitty hole, that's like a lot of ohms. Mm -hmm. If you drill a great big hole, that's like almost no ohms, right? Mm -hmm. So if I got two three ohm holes, it's equal to a six ohm hole, right? Okay. You got me? No, wait a minute, you're thinking the wrong way. Get you confused. The bigger the hole, the smaller the ohms. So if I do I'll drill two three, six ohm holes, it's like a three ohm hole. It's twice as big. The same amount of water is going to go out each one of them, and that's equal to a hole that's twice the size. So I mean, if you're thinking of it that way. So it's going to be three. So basically, you're going, it's always going to be less than the lowest if it's parallel. See, if one of these was two ohms and the other one was six ohms, it would have to be something like one ohm. You see, it's actually going to be less and less and more. Every time you get another path for current to flow, you got less resistance. That's all the easiest way to think about that. Which of the following components provides an input to the PCM? A, idle air control valve. B, coolant fan relay. C, service engine soon light. D, vehicle speed sensor. D. Why, Joe? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just asking why. Whenever your vehicle movement is yeah. sensing the speed. Look at what's underlined. It's input. Input. Input means the PCM is looking at this. It's not telling it to do something. It's just reading off of it. That's the difference between an input and an output. Anytime you've got something that's not working right, if it's not outputting right, if the computer is making a bad decision or not doing something like it's supposed to, I'm going to see which inputs affect that output if I can figure it out by reading the description and operation. Then I'm going to say, well, it looks at this, this, and this to make that decision. Obviously, I need to look at these three parameters and see if one of those is not telling the truth. Remember how I told you that story about that vehicle that we drove that only would only run about 50 miles an hour? Is that It was a Pontiac Aztec. And when you could get on it all you wanted to, and fuel pressure was good and constant, it had good strong fuel pressure, but when you hit about half throttle, that's all you had for speed. Uh, about 50 mile an hour is all you get. It's driving them people crazy. Well, I got to look at my mass airflow sensor, and it was it's supposed to go up to close to 5 volts, you know, whenever you're doing that, if you're looking at the voltage on it. This one here was hanging up about the middle. It could not read above that. So I said, well, let me do something here. So I stopped and unplugged the mass airflow sensor so it had to rely on its other sensors, and it ran like a race car. See what I'm saying? So if it looks like your mass airflow is hitting the ceiling, you see, it doesn't know. What do you call that? What kind of failure do you call that? You call that an in-range failure. The engine controller doesn't even know enough to throw you a code because as far as it knows, it don't know where... You know, if the mass airflow sensor is telling the truth or not. Now, some of the smarter ones have got rationality checks. It'll see wide open throttle and mass airflow hits that, and it may throw a code. In range failure. In range failure. That's right. Yeah, you did. You saw it somewhere. Hey, because I throw that word around here all the time. You know, in range failure means it's failing within the range that it's. If it stays in this range, it's not going to throw a code. Now, sometimes, like I say, it'll compare this to this, and it'll say this should agree with that, and it's not agree, and it's a rationality check. Like if it opens the idle air control, it's expecting the mass airflow to reflect that, right? 
if it's idling. If it raises the idle air, you know, so that it's trying to idle it up. If it idles up and mass airflow stays the same, it's going to say, I have a rationality fault, you know, we're checking that. All right, let's keep going. You guys are stretching and acting like you're turning into skeletons and all. OBD2 standards were originally developed and established by who? A, the California Air Resources Board. B, the Environmental Protection Agency. C, General Motors. Or D, none of the above. California Air Resources Board. If the vehicle speed signal is suddenly lost at road speed, what usually happens? A, the speedometer needle drops to zero. B, the speed control suddenly becomes dysfunctional. C, the transmission drops back into first gear. D, D all of the above. If How does the transmission correlate to vehicle speed? If it don't know how fast it's going, it's not going to shift out of first. Right? You got it? So that's something else you got to look at. If you see something like that happening, it'll usually throw you a PO500 code or something like that. Because 500 series codes are speed-related codes, whether it be engine or road or whatever. So, uh, okay, anybody, did you did y'all learn anything in here that you didn't know before? Do you know something now that you didn't know when you walked into this room? Yeah, I think we knew all of this. Huh? This is, we haven't discussed this before. The only thing that really wasn't this, I didn't know whether this thing was a piggyback or... Yeah. The face, uh, into the harness. You're looking into the harness. If you don't, if you know and understand that, you're a lot better off. If you don't know what you're looking at, you may be checking the wrong wires. So that's why it's important to to make that distinction. But I think everything else, is, yeah, except for that one beat, but only a few. Yeah. All right. Well, well, that concludes our.